Um, I just want to uh, keep a few background comments here, though. First of all, there's no presumption that everything needs to be scaled. Um, and so even though we have uh, many of you of the missions have proposed key technologies that you want to see scaled, and we're talking about pretty large numbers, it was quite impressive the earlier presentation, just keep in mind that some projects need to be or programs designed for scaling and taken to scale and others are more research projects that are doing research and proof of concept. And the question is to be selective about which ones we scale because we can't scale everything. Uh, secondly, there is no one right way to scale up. It depends upon the country context, the program itself, and um, what target scale we're talking about. One of the things that I do want to emphasize, and we'll be coming back to this, is that there's a, especially for those of us who work in low resource, weak governance countries, there's a presumption that uh, it's important to partner with the, with the public sector and as much as possible build capacity along with the, the lines of the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, but that um, increasingly we need to be looking at the private sector as the primary scaling up pathway because it often is sustainable in cases where the government does not have either the resources, financial or human, uh, or the capacity to deliver sustainably at scale without ongoing donor support. So basically the question is um, you should when I'm talking about scale for the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm always assuming that scale means sustainability and impact. Okay, so let me just be very clear on that. Um, and so um, I'm in a sense the complement to the amazing technology work, technological work that you all are doing, or many of you are doing, uh, though I did know with great pleasure about the uh, innovation lab on assets and market access. So I'm more about process than product. And, and particularly what is the business case and the market or private sector pathway that can sustainably scale and maintain the impact of this at scale. And, um, and for me, that has some key components. One is aligning incentives. Um, it's not just about the technology. It's why does it make sense for the various actors in the chain, whether they're input suppliers, farmers themselves, uh, the government if they're involved, output buyers, why does it make sense for them to adopt this technology? The answer I usually get is that it's bigger, stronger, faster, more powerful, more effective, twice as high yields, et cetera, et cetera. And I, Gary, Jan, and I have now been in two countries where it turns out that that may be necessary, but it's far from sufficient. If people aren't going to make money, somebody mentioned earlier that farmers often have a defensive strategy. If it's not going to address their concerns about risk, about their workload, especially during peak season, um, and whether they have adequate credit and extension services to adopt these technologies, it doesn't make sense for them, and therefore they won't do it. Uh, of course, they will do it if we subsidize them and incentivize them uh, during the project, but that is not how you go to scale. Okay. Uh, similarly, who's going to implement this at scale? It's not going to be USAID because we don't have those kind of resources. So what are the partners that we need to engage with? And last but not least, how do we re uh, make sure that the financial and fiscal constraints are addressed? If we're expecting the government to take some of this on, do they have the money? And are there cost savings that can be generated? If we're expecting the private sector to take this on, do they have the capital? Do they have the credit? Do farmers have the credit? So these questions of incentives, and when I use, I'm going to be using the word incentive in business case interchangeably, uh, even though they're not quite the same, and also even politics. But basically the question is, in order for this stuff to go to scale, a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders have to play a role, they have to participate, and they have to agree. Why would they do it? Is there incentive financial? Is it social? Is it political? Is it bureaucratic? Or whatever those incentives, those, those have to be aligned with the scale that we want to achieve with impact and sustainability. So let me dig in to this. And I just want to be clear. Um, the model we're looking at is very different from what we have traditionally talked about in terms of scaling. What do I mean by that? Uh, I don't think anybody's ever made it explicit. But when I was first introduced to FDF about two months ago, and, and I'm an expert now, it's amazing how quickly I learn, huh? Um, I think the implicit definition, so first of all, I was always told that all these technologies have been chosen because of their, they're scalable, okay? And the implicit criteria for scalable means that potentially a lot of people could benefit from this, 
Okay, that's almost never the definition of scalability that I use. I use that there's implementation capacity and incentive alignment at scale. Okay, so we're now using a very different definition, which is why I'm so happy to be here in my Messiah complex, which is that USAID's FTF projects and our particular technologies are going to, you can use the word you like, achieve critical mass to catalyze population level scaling. Okay, so it's not simply that in the small, and that our first few years we do 50,000, and then in our last two years that we do 100,000, but there's actually a denominator in there, okay, which is 50,000 as a percentage of what? 100,000 as a percentage of what? In Nepal, 100,000 is a lot of people. In China, 100,000 is nothing. Okay, so how it's not that we're got from. It, well, I want you to sh think about shifting your perspective from we started here and this is where we're getting to, as opposed to we want to end up with sustainable population level impact. How do we achieve a critical mass or a trigger point or a tipping point, whatever language you prefer, to? catalyze that spontaneous, sustainable population level impact. Okay, very different perspective. Okay, um, secondly, um, even though we traditionally operate in the context of what are, depending on the project, three to five year projects, we're asking you in that context to shift your perspective, which is that we may not be able to achieve population scale within one five year time frame. But we want to be putting in place, by the end of that five-year frame, the proof of concept, this works. These are the pathways, and I'll be using this language pathways quite a bit, of how it will go to scale, and making sure the building blocks, or if you prefer, the ecosystem, the policy environment, and I'll talk about these in detail, are all in place. So that's shifting from a project perspective to a programmatic perspective. Uh, or a multi-project perspective. And one of the things I think we have a challenge here is, um, without getting into the politics here, um, this is not my favorite person in the world, but a Secretary of Defense of the U.S. government sever said several years ago that you go, to the, you go to war with the army you have. Okay? And one of the responses to that was that may be true, but you build the army you need pretty quickly. Okay? So, in this case, it's a both and, which is that for better or worse, we are still using outdated, in my opinion, outdated mechanisms for scaling up of contracts with specific quantitative indicators, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And the FTF indicators were agreed on several years ago. It's a multi-agency process when the U.S. government, and we have this contracting mechanism that has strict requirements. So those are the mechanisms we have, but those mechanisms are frankly ill-suited for scaling because they actually don't usually contain incentives to have sustainability post-project, to put in place the building blocks and the ecosystem and the pathways post-project. So we have to do both. We have to meet the requirements of the existing pro project targets, FDF targets and indicators, and we need to be working together to say, how can we go beyond that in the context of the existing mechanisms we have? And also, how can we create new mechanisms that will allow us to incentivize scaling up, not just for the partners on the ground, but for implementing partners here, okay? And I want you to know that I and others are working with BFS uh, to figure out how do we need to change the way we do business to move forward, but also to scale up with what we've got. Um, and so this needs to be sustainable. When I talk about politically, organizationally, and financially, I mean politically, why will the government or the private sector have the business case and the incentives to continue this? Will they have the organizational capacity to continue to implement these activities beyond the time frame of the project? And will they have the financial resources? Okay, our job is to create that. It's not simply to hit the numbers. Okay, so I want to distinguish a little bit between, because I really want to emphasize this difference between traditional project management and scalability, or sc what we're now talking about scaling up. Um, I have, I, I know all of you love log frames or results management frameworks, okay, um, and dream of them at night. Um, uh, I won't go into your private life, but I'm glad it's exciting for you. Um, but there's a, a tendency 
to see to these uh, logical frameworks and results management frameworks have become something of a straitjacket as they both allow for due diligence and testing theories of change, but scaling up never we're not in, scaling up cannot be done through social engineering. Unfortunately, the theory of change, the pathways, the management frameworks don't always work when you get to on the ground in practice. And one of the challenges of scaling up is to be open to m multiple pathways and to pivoting uh, when the market, which we're engaging with, uh, or, or the beneficiaries or the adopters change. So let me give you an example. Okay. Uh, and I, Gary and I just spent uh, several weeks in Bangladesh and Cambodia uh, with uh, very good projects going there with a lot of potential. Uh, and one of the projects I thought that had the most potential, which we'll hear about more this afternoon, was IDE's CISA-MI project. And that project in particular is using uh, local service providers to provide machinery services. So basically they're borrowing several pages from the cutting edge literature on international development to figure out how to do what I think they call in South Asia sachet sizing. Uh, try to say that three times straight. So just like Unilever or Hindustan Lever has made uh, washing powder, uh, detergent, and other products affordable for the people at the bottom of the pyramid by putting them in small sachets, that project has made machinery services for small farmers affordable by shifting from a buying machines to a leasing machinery services project. Okay, Their original framework, because they're part of a CISA project, was to have a tremendous impact on cereal production, cereal incomes, cereal uh, affordability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're still pursuing that pathway, but, but they had a surprise innovation, which when you think about it shouldn't have been a surprise, which is their axial flow pumps, which are basically water pumps that are much more efficient, that were imported from Thailand, have gone viral already in the aquaculture sector. Okay, Logical framework, grant proposal, contract, all about cereals. Private sector feedback spontaneously saying, this is a winner in aquaculture. So. Do we just stick with the existing linear framework or do we respond to the market uh, pathways and incentives that spontaneously arise and pivot in that direction? I hope that the answer from that question is clear to all of us, even though there are constraints within the contracts and indicators uh, that we have, we need to do both. And we need to be in a constant dialogue between implementing partners and the people in the missions because ultimately, if one pathway and one uh, technology use is more viable than another, it will still impact the FTF goals on poverty, nutrition, and stunting. Okay, uh, Fish is just a viable pathway of cereal, so how do we make that pivot? Secondly, there's a tendency to focus on beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries, and um, in scaling up we have what I would call both winners and losers and also the importance of indirect beneficiaries. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, a lot of you are working on cereals. One of the common things when I look at the frameworks that we have, the results management frameworks, is that there's often a problem because on the, the FTF strategy for Nepal is like this, it's also like this in Bangladesh and Cambodia, getting new seed varieties registered, or at least doing it legally without bribes, is extremely difficult, time consuming, and cumbersome. Okay, and often there are local government monopolies or parastatals on production of seeds or distribution of seeds because it's a valuable crop. Well, if we bring in new seeds and we do it through the private sector, maybe the public sector feels threatened. That can often be a common problem. So how do we anticipate the politics of that and rather than, oh, the public sector, the public sector, they distort the market, they subsidize the market, they make it actually difficult for private sector pathways to be viable. On the one hand, we need to address those issues, but on the other hand, we need to address those issues in a way that the quote-unquote losers actually feel that they have a stake in the game. Okay? That's a, that's a different perspective from that we're currently using. The other perspective is that I know that there's been an ongoing conversation about whether we get to count towards our numbers beneficiaries, direct and indirect beneficiaries. From a scaling up perspective, and by the way, uh, even though I'm actually obviously invited here by USAID, I don't necessarily speak for USAID in this, 
But I have been pushing hard, and I think there's a lot of understanding now in the agency that actually, for scaling purposes, it's all about the indirect beneficiaries. We can achieve critical mass, maybe, in terms of direct beneficiaries, but to show that the scaling is spontaneously diffusing, we've triggered something, it's actually that second adopter who didn't get a training session, who didn't get subsidized, who didn't get you know, all the bells and whistles that we're handing out as projects, took this up, is a real sh sign that we've achieved success. Okay? And it's the sa same thing true if we have input suppliers who are key parts of our, our, our scaling strategy, or buyers, or wholesale manufacturers or distributors. It's not the 20 or 30 or 200 input suppliers who are agreeing to provide the seeds or the this or the that because we subsidized or they came to a training session. It's the other 200 that said, look, this guy's making a lot of money doing what the project is doing. We want in on this too, and we're willing to invest in it even without subsidies. Or the existing input suppliers who may be, sure, we subsidize them to help them uh, become early adopters and minimize the risk of change, and I think that's legitimate, as long as we're very careful about that and very explicit that we don't want to give so much subsidies that we're not spoiling the market or creating disincentives downstream for them. But again, for those guys, are, are, th are they making money? Are their sales increasing? Are, if they're buying a machinery from CISA MI or from the di distributors that CISA MI is facilitating, are they so, this is such a good thing, they're buying a second machine, a third machine, a fourth machine, or a fifth machine. So those, for me, are the kind of indicators about indirect beneficiaries that we really want to see for scaling up. Third, and I'm sorry if this, I'm glad that all of you are sitting down because this can be a little frightening, okay? But under projects, one of the reasons we have a tendency to do everything ourselves is, sure, partly it's because local capacity is weak, uh, but also part of this, that's the way we can make sure we can control results, right? If the, our direct hire field workers or NGO partners that we've subcontracted to are actually out there delivering and counting the numbers, we can hit those numbers. But at scale, we can't do that. At scale, we actually have to partner with other organizations, private sector manufacturers, private sector distributors, local input suppliers, et cetera, et cetera, that we don't necessarily control. Um, and we have a tension there. By giving up control, we have the potential for sustainable impact and scale, but we, and we again have to work together, both the missions and the technical experts as well as the implementing partners on, we want to shift from we can hit these numbers by doing it ourselves to we can catalyze partners to have sustainable pathways for scaling and actually get much bigger numbers, but with a greater re return is a slightly higher risk. And how do we manage that in a way that we hit our targets on the one hand? And I think what we really need to be talking about is diversified portfolios. I mean, basically, we're, think we're moving to a scaling approach, which is like a venture capital approach, which is we invest in 10 different technologies and 10 different pathways, knowing that half may fail. I mean, one of the things I find most astonishing as com someone who comes in from the outside is that everything seems to work all the time. Okay. <laughs> Well, how is that possible in a low resource, low governance context? The only way that's possible is because we're doing it all ourselves in a way that's not sustainable. Okay? I actually think that if we were doing this seriously, we wouldn't have 80% success rates, we'd have 20% success rates. I don't know a venture capitalist in the world who expects to hit more than 3 out of 10. Okay? So, the thing is, can we hit the three out of ten and make sure that those winners are so effective that we are let, we are achieving large scale? Okay, a different perspective. Okay, we need to have explicit resources for scaling up, which currently we don't have, and I'll talk about what those more are. And it's a different skill set. Okay. By the fact that we're working in multiple partnerships uh, with multiple stakeholders and boundary spanning, we need to be doing advocacy, uh, convening, aligning incentives, as opposed to technology and training. There's nothing wrong with technology and training, and that's a core part of our, our functions, but it's not sufficient for scaling. Um, one of my favorite sayings is to, uh, to borrow a metaphor, in the development world, no matter what the problem, training is a solution. Okay? Um, so, that um, works when we're first introducing and doing a demonstration projects, but training is not the equivalent of building ecosystems, of building building blocks, of creating the policy space, of aligning incentives. Okay, training is simply about knowledge transfer, and if you're really lucky, behavior change. Okay, but I think behavior change takes more than simply training. 
All right. So I um, just want to quickly um, put on my professor hat for a minute and go over some of the types of scaling. The reason I'm doing this is not because we're going to have a quiz after this, although those of you, some of you probably like quizzes. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Uh, but more to think about how are we scaling. So one of the ways to think about scaling is horizontal. We go farmer to farmer, district to district, farmer to farmer, but the diffusion mechanism is lateral. Okay? Early adopters to second tier, middle adopters to late adopters, or laggards if you prefer, versus top down. Okay? Is it because we're changing policies, changing legal instruments? Which of these makes the most sense in your context for scaling up your innovation? And often it's both. Often we, but, but that gets to the second question, which I'll, I'm jumping around here, I know, which is, is it demand driven or supply driven? Are we driving the process or, or are we handing off a process that needs to be driven at the end of our project to another organization? Or at some point, can we catalyze spontaneous demand driven? Do we need to introduce to everybody farmer in the country who can use it? Or at some point, if we can create a core mass, a supply-driven process, critical mass, it'll spontaneously diffuse by demand-driven. And how do we get there? Again, some pathways or approaches will be right for some projects, which is actually if we do need to reach all farmers. Versus in other cases, we can uh, we can get we can trigger a demand-driven process. And if it is that handoff type of thing, how do we know where we are? Okay, how do we know when we've achieved critical mass? Okay, one of the things I haven't yet seen a lot of research on, and I think the asset market access, maybe there needs to be another uh, innovation lab, is actually on measuring that. What is the critical mass in this country? What are the diffusion mechanisms? How many farmers, if there is a demonstration farmer or a farmer field school, how many second tier third farmers are adopting that? What encourages or discourages that? Are they adopting the whole package or just certain things, et cetera? So actually making those pathways quite clear and what are best practices in triggering that spontaneous diffusion process is a key issue for scaling. Okay, and we need more research and more knowledge of best practices in that area. And I'm, again, I'm not just talking about farmers, I'm talking about all the parts of the value chain here. Okay, um, spontaneous versus managed, I've kind of alluded to that. So how can we shift from starting a process by managing it and driving it with a supply driven to a demand driven spontaneous process, horizontal process. Okay, that's I think the key challenge that I'm laying down here. Okay, so I want to talk about what are the components of a scaling up strategy and how we get them. And one of the things I want to be quite clear, clear on is what is the it, the scaling up, the model of the intervention. Okay, there's a tendency to be solely focused on the technology. It's a high yield, drought resistant rice, or, or actually drought and flood resistant rice. It's new varieties of horticulture, of uh, eggplants. It's new types of cultivation practices, drip irrigation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but because we're using a value chain approach and because we're also using a market oriented approach, actually they're often complementary activities. For example, some of the new innovations we're introducing require ongoing intensive extension support, some don't. Some require access to credit, some don't. Okay, we tend to do the entire value chain at Scale, at, at small scale, but we can't necessarily do that at large scale without engaging with partners. So first of all, we need to make clear what those complementary activities to strengthen the value chain are and how we scale those, not just the technology. Okay? Um, and what parts of the ecosystem need to be built. Secondly, I really want to emphasize this. Our scaling up goals need to be seen in the context of the denominator. What is population scale? It's not simply about adding a zero, 5,000 to 50,000. It's about there's potential for 50,000 or 500,000 farmers. We want to hit at least 10, 20% before we finish because that will be critical mass. Okay? So uh, as I'm working with missions to revise their scaling strategies, there's a real emphasis on hitting this critical mass. Okay? That we can trigger this spontaneous demand driven. Um, approach and that the parts of the ecosystem, that what we're going to call the spaces, and I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, have been created. 
Okay, so we need to know what those spaces are and where we need to create space. If there isn't capacity for extension services, that's a place we need to create space. If there isn't access to credit or financial space, we need to create that space. And we need to figure out what the bus pathway to do that. Focusing on extension services, uh, because often public sector extension services are weak, we've been focusing on different mechanisms. I think in, in Nepal and some other countries we have va agro vets or village vets. So basically this is trying to create a viable local delivery mechanism that can be financially self-sustaining. In other places we've been thinking about embedding extension services in feed suppliers or input suppliers. And in other places, but the, one of the questions we have to ask is given that our primary focus is on farmers that are under a dollar and a quarter a day, is it financially viable for either input suppliers or aggravets to serve those communities or that population? And if not, how do we achieve that? So maybe we need multiple pathways depending upon the crop, the, the, the innovation, and the um, uh, viability for private sector providers to reach the bottom of the pyramid. Okay? And once we figure out who's going to, what those pathways are and what those roles are, we make sure, need to make sure that this whole model is aligned and I'll come back to that. I'm not going to go into this, but I think this is a useful tool that we've developed and are now using a lot in Washington and other sectors. This is a scalability assessment checklist or tool and when we're looking at something, whether it's scalable or not, we say, first of all, is it credible? Okay, um, we tend to focus on credibility in terms of uh, efficacy, um, but my experience is, again, maybe in the countries you work, it's different. Policymakers and private sector uh, adapters actually don't read refereed academic journals. Okay, uh, could be wrong that you work in different places, but and I know a lot of you are from the university, and you have an incentive to publish, which is all great, but actually they need to see it. They need to have a local organization like a, a, the National Agricultural Research Center sign off on it. They need endorsements. They need to understand how the causal chain works, not just that there's an RCT that shows that this increases yield by 30%. Okay? Uh, I find it really funny that we're all evidence-based, except we don't use behavioral economics or the new neuroscience, which all shows that actually most people do not make decisions to adopt and implement technology based on formal evidence. Okay, so we're evidence-based, except we don't use the evidence of how people make decisions. Go figure that one out. Okay, how people make decisions is often emotional, tangible success, uh, and observability, not on statistical uh, returns. Okay, so we need both. Is it relevant? We not tend to focus on need, but not demand. Now I know a lot of our projects do demand generation, and that's really good, and as it should be. Okay, but are we creating sufficient effective demand? Just because this poor farmer needs this, because we say he needs it or she needs it, uh, and uh, the sociological studies and the epidemiological studies uh, show that, doesn't mean that's a felt need. So how do we create demand, or is that realistic? Is it aligned with policy incentives? Is it aligned with the market strategies of the private sector we're aligning with? Okay, has to be relevant. Doesn't just have to work in our logical framework and results management framework. I've already talked about the winners and losers. Is it better than what's out there? Again, not just more e efficacious, but is it more cost effective? Very different criteria. Is it easily implementable? Okay. Um, so for example, we, Gary and I just uh, visited the fertilizer deep placement. Uh, it's a great innovation, has dramatic implications in terms of reduced use of fertilizer, climate change benefits, increased yields, cost savings for farmers, but it turns out it's not easy to use, not easy to implement. It's very labor intensive. It requires much larger capi initial capital outlays, and so this is much more of a challenge. So just because it's uh, efficacious doesn't mean it's easy to implement, okay? And finally, therefore, is it affordable, okay? So this is the uh, model of scaling we're using, which is basically we have our technological innovation and we have our vision of scale or what scale looks like at population or zone of influence scale. The question is how do we get there? And I've talked about some of these things already, but we is financing available either for the ongoing scaling up, for the various actors that are involved who have to adopt this, 
Do machinery service providers, in the case of IDE, Bangladesh, CISA MI program, do they have credit to buy these machines? Uh, do farmers have credit to be able to buy uh, these briquettes of urea fertilizer? Do, does the public sector or the private sector um, extension services have organizational capacity? Are beyond one-off trainings to continually provide extension services? If the policy enabling environment isn't aligned, how do we make that happen? How do we get the seed regulations to allow for faster approval and registration of, of new, more effic effective seeds? Have we aligned the incentives? Who are the partners? And last but not least, and we haven't talked about this yet, what happens at scale? Often at the market scale, you're going to see changes in input or output prices. Have we taken that into effect? One of the things that I've often been questioning, and I'm eager to talk with you who are involved with the nutrition, is that um, I hear often, this is going to increase productivity, increase output, reduce prices. Okay, so if it reduces prices, we have greater consumption, greater impact. And if it reduces prices, we make more income. Hold on a minute. I missed that one. Okay. So somehow we're having our cake and eat it too. We're having greater output and lower prices, okay, which is great for consumption. And we have greater output and lower prices, which is great for profits and income. Okay. I've yet to see a study of what the income elasticities or price elasticities are for household consumption of fish, cereals, Commercial, commercial horticulture, et cetera. So I, I love the theories of change and the results frameworks. I just don't see the empirical evidence showing that they actually work with this particular value chain, this particular uh, technology, in this particular market at this particular time. Okay, so let's do some reality testing of the theories of change and the results management framework we're doing if we're really gonna believe that the scale story we're telling actually holds, okay? Wow. Okay, I think I need to change the, this slide. So particularly, um, I want to emphasize we, we need the numbers, but we need critical mass. We need pathways. And we know t need to show that the proof of concept of how we're doing this is going to work. Okay, we tend to show this technology works, but is the delivery mechanism working? So I'm really emphasizing the delivery mechanism and the implementation as opposed to the what we're delivering. Okay, and how do we measure that we've created the spaces or the ecosystem? Just like we have indicators for the number of people, well, I could hit those numbers by just giving all this stuff away. That doesn't tell me anything about sustainability and scale. In fact, many of you, of you have every incentive to give this away because it'll allow you to hit your numbers. Okay, but that's but we also need indicators that are aligned with scaling. Okay, so if I can just put the pieces of the puzzle together in my negative one minute, um, and I'm aware that I'm running late, I, I will try to tie this up in a minute or two. This is this that you can't read. Uh, Rob told me that we have to have at least part of a sl every slide cannot be legible. Okay, so uh, Jeff set that good example this morning, and I'm just trying to follow in those footsteps. Okay, this says what is the innovation, and I want to talk about how this gets aligned. Okay, so an innovation has two implications. It requires capacity to deliver it uh, at scale. So what do I mean by capacity? Can you hit the numbers? and it requires capability to do it right, okay? Some pathway, some organization has to have both the capacity and the capability, okay? We tend to run into the following problem. Public sector has capacity, delivers at large scale, doesn't have very good capability, and private sector actors often, or NGOs, have capability, they really know how to do this, but they're often a very small scale, they don't have capacity. How do we achieve both, okay? How do we get both of these in place, okay? So uh, I think I'll just uh, want to end with this slide, which is that particularly if to achieve critical mass is not viable in the lifetime of our project, and we're thinking about handing it off, either or we ourselves as pr implementing partners and USAID working together with our other partners need to function as what I call intermediary organizations, which is the, being in charge of the process from small scale to large scale is going to scale. And that's an intermediary role about creating the spaces and driving that process. We need to demonstrate marketing and do demand creation. We need to improve cost efficiency. We need to do advocacy with the public sector and align private sector incentives not just for our direct beneficiaries, but for the indirect beneficiaries as second and third tier adopters all the way up and down the chain. We need to create and coordinate partnerships because we can't do this all by ourselves. 
We need to build organizational capacity and capability uh, at to, to for scaling up. We need to strengthen the Econ system. We need to monitor fidelity. So these are all about creating the space for scaling, which is very different from simply the engineering process of managing and implementing a, um, a results management framework in a project. So welcome to the new world of scaling up. I'm going to be here for the next two and a half days, and I'll be on the field trip. I have already met some of you, but if you want to get some one-on-one -on -one time with me, um, I'd be delighted to do that uh, for lunch, breakfast, dinner, coffee, um, or whatever. So thank you very much. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.